we, we used to travel between Leh and Kargil and Dras and Batalik, all those places which became famous later. Vikram Batra, I met the famous Vikram Batra. Met him. Met him. And uh, third day after that, uh, he died in that action. And uh, he had narrated the story of how Pakistanis were taunting him. Sher Shah, ab wa wapas nahi ja paoge, wagara. But you know, he was a very gung-ho and a very confident young man at that point in time. Or even with somebody knowing, you just put in the paper. So that used to be called booth capturing. It was an art you know, of the political parties. Whoever was the Bahubali would be able to do that. So we have come a long way from there. Wild so, West. Wild <laughs> West. <laughs> yeah, many ways. What Bihar, kind of India did you guys have, British. man? <laughs> <laughs> so we have seen both sides. We have seen the Wild West of uh, India or the Wild West kind of India. We used to uh, wait for three years to get a uh, scooter, a Bajaj two-wheeler. I don't want to know all this. Also, <laughs> <laughs> <'cause> like, <laughs> You will not realize depressive. it. Yeah, when my, my parents talk about it, it seems sad. sad yeah. Like you guys look at it fondly, but that's not a country. I personally love speaking about history on TRS, but it has to be with the right communicators, the right storytellers and the right media professionals. Nitin Gokhale is one of the most respected minds whose journey began in the world of journalism. Today he's known as one of the leading strategy analysts and his commentaries on the world of geopolitics and defense strategy are respected by not just Indians, but people all over the world. That's not specifically what we spoke about in the show today. We actually spoke about what led to the kind of times that we see in India today. So this is the history of India post-independence. If you're someone who enjoys our episodes with Abhijit Chavda, you will enjoy this kind of a breakdown as well. I feel a lot of Indians need to learn much more about Indira Gandhi's tenure, Jawaharlal Nehru's tenure, what happened after Indira Gandhi. These kind of topics are covered in today's episode. Go see the topic list for today's episode to know what kind of conversation this is. All I'll say is, he's a man who's seen some very intense experiences, but then he's also a man who's constantly learning. He's constantly studying the past in order to analyze the present and the future much better. He's a fantastic communicator. And today, Nitin Gokhale sir is on the Ranveer Show. So enjoy the conversation. Nitin Gokhale, sir. How are you? Very well, thank you. It's good to be in this city. When I'm talking to someone as senior as you, there was a point in my life where I used to be very nervous to talk to people like yourself. Uh, and now I've done so many podcasts that I've realized that everyone's a bro on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we, all of us have a child inside us, right? Yeah. And some children just become... Uh, Mentors to the defense leaders of our country. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just happenstance. That's just accident. Um, over the years, uh, you know, one has interacted with them and slowly become their mentors. But I still learn a lot in those interactions when I go to these places. Okay. Uh, you were telling me about how, very interestingly so, you switched from being a sports journalist to uh, what? What did you switch to? Why didn't you say it? <laughs> well, I, I gradually switched. You know, journalism uh, of our kind in our uh, time in the 80s when I started. First of all, I'm an accidental journalist. I wanted to join the forces, uh, especially the Air Force as a fighter pilot. Instead of that, I accidentally strayed into journalism just as a stopgap arrangement. But I got seduced by the um, mechanism of journalism, the uh, passion in journalism and stayed on. And here I am, 40 years, uh, not a moment's uh, regret in doing so. So, I started off as a trainee sports journalist. Then, uh, gradually, I started doing, putting the pages together in a local uh, regional newspaper in Assam. And uh, then, uh, what we call gutter journalists, that is the mun municipal uh, reporting of uh, no water, the uh, sewage not working, uh, you know, the uh, municipality authorities not working, those kind of things. And then gradually, because I was in Assam, uh, in the Northeast, uh, the only thing that was getting attention that time in the uh, early or mid 80s was insurgency, violence. So the military and the militants became staple diet for news. So then I gradually turned to that and that's how I have become um, primarily known as a conflict reporter. 
mm. and um, a defense analyst or a strategic affairs analyst whatever you want to call it but that's where it is how do you introduce yourself to an american kid who meets you in america today you have a 13 year old american <laughs> kid saying hey sir what do you do how do you well i say i i report on wars and violence and the kind of uh, star wars uh, or afghanistan reporting that uh, i mean afghanistan fighting that you would see on television we are the reporters who do it i, I would do it that way but primarily i would say i am uh, more interested in the history and the um, the texture of uh, war how it takes place why conflicts take place and uh, how conflicts pan out so i have covered the kargil war for instance i have covered the sri lanka final war uh, between the ltt and the sri lankan uh, forces so and the uh, several insurgencies in the northeast uh, which were there at their peak in the 80s and 90s when i was reporting from there so i have uh, learned a lot from those uh, men from both sides and women uh, in the insurgents ranks but uh, that's the way uh, conflict pans out so i would introduce myself as a conflict observer now earlier a conflict reporter but uh, conflict in societies uh, are inevitable uh, across the globe and that's what uh, i report or uh, have reported okay you've done on ground reporting as well very much so i am actually primarily an on ground reporter so i've done 45 days in kargil 3 years uh, more or less uh, in sri lanka and 23 years in the northeast uh, which is now in the news because of the manipur violence but this was exactly the thing that was happening across all states of the northeast at one point in the late 80s early 90s so one has covered all those insurgencies which one did you find psychologically the most difficult <sighs> towards the mid 90s uh, i realized that uh, i was doing it mechanically uh, and it there was a thrill in it it uh, in assam uh, when the insurgency what was at its peak in the late 90s one incident uh, really shook me which i must uh, share and what happens to conflict reporters or uh, can happen to conflict reporters is one example that i can cite so in 1997 uh, mother teresa died uh, of illness of old age whatever and our elder son was then in he was about 8 uh, years old studying in a convent school in guwahati he came back early because they declared holiday because she had passed away so i was doing something as to work out of home and i was writing something he said i have excited i have come back home early you know and they came back and went away then after about half an hour he came back and said uh, tell me uh, who killed mother teresa so i said uh, nobody killed her she died no but somebody has to kill her no because all around him he used to hear every day that policeman has been killed or an insurgent has been killed i used to speak on the phone with my fellow reporters or my fellow uh, my, with my colleagues where i used to ask what is the score today five killed three injured you know very casually and he was also absorbing that same thing that death means somebody has to kill the other person there's natural deaths concept was not in his mind at that point at that age i suddenly realized you know i have become almost inhuman or i become casual in treating deaths since then i started uh, being very careful about reporting the human side of insurgency its fallout victims the perpetrators all of them have human side to it and uh, so my tone and tenor of my reporting changed since then so you were probably dry about it earlier very dry and very matter of fact okay very matter of fact but then i started bringing in the stories behind the people who are involved in uh, the violence in the insurgency counter insurgency all that pardon my language <laughs> but what's the most f- up thing you've seen in your career a family of seven or eight people uh, having a gun down and a 3 year old toddler uh, splashing in the pool of blood in that house uh, was the most shocking thing uh, it's i still remember where was this this was in a district called nalbari in assam uh, one family of a uh, united liberation front of assam uh, was a group a insurgent group uh, one of the leaders his family his brother and his sister in law and the entire family were gunned down by nobody knows who but when we uh, arrived there we saw this uh, site he was an insurgent leader he the insurgent leader wasn't there in the house it was his brother and his relatives were uh, massacred so amongst the insurgent leaders basically insurgent is another way of saying a soft terrorist 
Right. Yes, uh, so there is, uh, this is always the confusion that uh, happens because uh, insurgents are uh, people who are fighting for the, uh, for say a political cause. Okay. Not that the terrorists don't fight for a, terror, uh, for a political cause, but insurgency in Northeast was uh, mainly about seceding from India in one uh, particular case in Nagaland. The others were about uh, righting the wrongs or perceived wrongs that they felt uh, about a community or an ethnic group or a region. Uh, so therefore they were called, their distinction was that they were not mindlessly killing people. They would pick only the security officials or officials who were decision makers in uh, perpetrating the discrimination against a group or a region. Like bureaucrats? Uh, bureaucrats, police officers politicians sometimes, but they wouldn't uh, indiscriminately kill or plant a bomb in a bus which is uh, taking civilians or families, they won't do that. So therefore, there was a subtle distinction at one point in time, they had principles, they would uh, not attack convoys which were carrying families from place A to place B, uh, all those were there. So we used to be very careful in using those terms, terrorist, insurgents, militants, all these were uh, not very interchangeable words, should not be interchangeable words. Some people use it, but we were very careful that time when I was there. Okay. Uh, who would kill an insurgent or an insurgent's family that way? This seems like some sort of a revenge killing. So, because of uh, the opaque nature of insurgencies and counterinsurgencies, there were groups, vigilante groups, which came up with support of the government or who were pro-government people who had come out of the insurgent groups had become rivals. Why? Because uh, again, leadership tussle in the insurgent uh, groups or uh, they were lured away by the governments. Money. Be money, uh, jobs or even giving political role to them. So governments, uh, any uh, nation state or uh, a government would use what we call Sam Dam Dandabhed, you know, to break the ranks or break the unity of the insurgents, that, that happened at several places, in, in several instances in the Northeast. Explain Sam Dan, 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 Dan So, uh, there is a thing that uh, Chanakya had said that use all kinds of uh, methods to subjugate the uh, adversary or the enemy. So, it can be uh, uh, money, uh, uh, sort of lure of uh, money, it could be uh, hard uh, act like you know violence or killing somebody beheading somebody in front of the crowd so that you know the terror is spread there's uh, uh, dand, dand is that uh, hard one uh, dam is like uh, you know buy them out uh, then uh, bhed is uh, divide them you know bhed karo do, do no mein. so that is a kind of thing uh, which he had said so sam dam dand bhed is what uh, they used to say that any means to subjugate the adversary is uh, par for course Sam is like a positive way. Positive thing, yeah. So like, uh, talk to them. Talk to them it. or persuade them and, you know, sort of emotionally blackmail them. Uh, something of that kind. I was born in 1993. Uh, God has blessed me with a very sharp memory. So, I have very vivid memories of 1997 at least. I think that's the earliest that I can remember. Junior KG. Right. Um, there was a movie called Sarfarosh. Yes. Amir Khan's Sarfarosh. John Matthews is the director, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Wow, okay. <laughs> Okay. Sarfarosh kind of scared the shit out of me as a kid because of the opening scene where they show families traveling in a bus and then insurgents stop the bus. So I think militants stop the yes. bus in Kashmir <laughs> and uh, gun down all the families right. and all that. And I have this memory of an uncle of mine telling me that, see, this is how our country is. This is what happens out there in the country. Right. So this is one thought bubble. Mm. Cut to 2023, I have a dear friend of mine, Abhay Gulbani. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about exactly this, that we remember memories of the 90s being very violent. Right. Uh, was the world much more violent then? Or is the world still as violent and it's just not reported as much? No, I think uh, every era has the same kind of violence, but it shifts from one place to the other. India was very violent in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, very violent. So, there was Punjab insurgency, Indian army was involved in uh, IPKF or the Indian peacekeeping force was deployed in uh, Sri Lanka against the Tamil Tigers for three years. Huge violence there. At the same time, the Kashmir violence started in 1990 and the insurgencies uh, in uh, the Northeast. At one point in time, Northeast had more than 40 insurgent groups with uh, free flow of arms, guns, and then drugs, uh, mi mixed with drug smuggling, 
uh, carving out areas uh, for of influence like that so it was a violent period india has gone through a lot of uh, pain and trouble in those uh, years i think what we see now is nothing compared to what was there because we had bombay blasts in 1993 we had riots communal riots used to be very rampant so one has lived through uh, many of these i uh, like you i remember the biggest riot in india at, in my view or my memory was in 1969 when i was barely 7 years old in amdavad so everybody talks about the 2002 violence in gujarat uh, people have forgotten what happened in 1969 if you go back and uh, try and dig out maybe a similar number or more people died in communal uh, violence that time what's the context here same 69 again was hindu muslim so i don't even remember but i remember very distinctly how people were roasted alive in a bakery uh, i was uh, in class 1 i think in and i used to go to school and everything shut down uh, i have a distinct memory of uh, watching uh, one man being tied to a pole uh, and being beaten by people watching uh, watching as in Indian? as in as, a, as i am mean, watching myself from the from the window of our house Uh, like that it used to be that bad police never came so quickly uh, all that so i remember i still have that memory in my head man why was india like this like why was there an underworld in the first place <laughs> like <laughs> I, and such a rampant underworld not it was not just underworld you know even ordinary people got caught into it uh, really if you ask me in, and india was like mexico back then well i haven't seen mexico so i won't know but i'll tell you what uh, in the partition time uh, and even before that uh, political parties the congress that time and the muslim league and jinna and you know others uh, they were constantly looking for their own benefits and therefore and the british uh, made sure that they remain divided you know the policy was called divide and rule the british were doing that and uh, that continued during partition we had a very bloody partition as you were aware people migrated in huge numbers mammoth numbers from uh, india to what became pakistan and from pakistan to india and those memories continued and uh, some of those painful uh, fallouts were carried through and then people dis- politicians discovered that this is one way of keeping uh, say the muslim community uh, on their side saying we will protect you Uh, vote for us and block that's how the concept of vote bank came in right and um, therefore uh, if you engineer riots i'm using that word because that's something that we learned as young reporters that riots are engineered in most cases they're not spontaneous somebody sort of lights a spark and then it spreads it was done to instill fear uh, amongst both communities and then you vote for your own uh, leaders or your own people to instill fear to create a need for protection absolutely and which will be given by the politicians or the police and that's how uh, india was okay uh do you think jawaharlal nehru was as bad as the conspiracy theories around him claim that he was so uh, if you give me a specific instance maybe i'll be able to tell you but i'll tell you what my view about jawaharlal nehru is when he took over india was sitting on a powder cage uh, the communal riots were happening partition uh, migration was happening india was a poor country uh, illiterate country um, also he made a lot of mistakes he assumed a lot of things in international relations he wanted to be a statesman he wanted to india to be a moral force without realizing that moral force or authority comes only when you are hard power so uh, hard power in terms of army uh, uh, in the terms of military he neglected that did he grow up rich he was a rich man's son uh, very rich sounds like a little sheltered boy very mentality much. see i want to draw your attention to one fact which this generation may not know the, everybody talks about nehru and gandhi having spent time in prison long years in prison the prison for them was some guest house aga khan palace or whatever they could read they could you know carry on their daily activities in a normal time they were just confined uh, to that place it wasn't prison prison not like uh, solitary confinement not like you know what you go through hard grind nothing and they didn't do they were political prisoners mm. and they were treated by the british uh, very gingerly 
uh, with velvet gloves and uh, they kept them uh, in relative comfort uh, whether it's uh, Mahatma Gandhi or Jawaharlal Nehru or any of those political leaders or their political prisoners and therefore they wrote books discovery of India they wrote uh, things uh, and uh, he of course came from a very uh, rich family his father was a lawyer then founder I mean one of the early members of the Indian National Congress. So, uh, his worldview was uh, influenced by the European thoughts, for instance. I mean, there's so many people who come on the show and chat all over his legacy. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I, I've always tried digging out the truth on this show and I'm very open to hearing a whole positive side about him. No, so, uh, I because I uh, concentrate my uh, own work in uh, strategic and military matters or foreign affairs and all that. See, Nehru had this strong desire to be a world leader. Mm. And he wanted to project India as a moral force, having one uh, mistaken notion again, uh, having one freedom through non-violence. Actually, if you look back uh, during those years between, say, 1920 and 1947, the kind of violence India went through uh, was uh, like what you described, Mexico, the Wild West, uh, there are so many instances of violence. And British got scared of uh, the naval mutiny, for instance, was the last uh, straw on the camel's back. Uh, and so many other things happened there, got enfeebled because of the World War II. Uh, so, it's again a mistaken notion to say India won freedom through non-violence and ahimsa and all that. But uh, Nehru uh, wanted to continue that. He didn't want any military uh, kind of a thing. He was suspicious of the military or the police, anything in uniform. Why? That I have not really, uh, you know, uh, analyzed or not gone into it. But uh, going by the evidence that we have, how he um, disempowered the military, how he treated the military uh, shabbily, didn't allow them to expand, didn't allow them to acquire uh, the necessary wherewithal to fight a war. And he misjudged China completely. Uh, the Chinese uh, really played him along and uh, humiliated him at the end of it in 1962. So, uh, in my uh, field of work, Nehru comes across uh, as, uh, again, to use your term, uh, loosely informed or uh, half informed and highly opinionated because he didn't apply his mind or didn't heed uh, advice from the right people about what were the intentions of the Chinese against India or uh, the designs that Chinese had against India and we paid for it and that shadow of that defeat remained on the psyche of the Indian decision makers on the minds of the Indian public for a long period, almost 40-45 years except for the fact that in 1967 we did give them a bloody nose in Nathula uh, within five years of the humiliation in 1962 but that apart we were always very cautious about how we deal with China uh, and we were always gung-ho about how we deal with Pakistan because of that historical legacy and I blame Nehru for it because he uh, had a very romantic view of the Chinese or the Asian solidarity as he described it at one point in time. But the Chinese were a completely different league. They knew their national interest, their self-interest and they uh, did what they wanted to do this, I mean to humiliate India. India, Nehru did not look at national interest, he looked at his personal interest. That's my grouse against him. Two-pronged question. Yeah. Hypothetically, what would have happened if we had won the 1962 Indochina war? Second question, specifically, maybe strategically, why did we lose? We lost because the military was never prepared and the military advice was never heeded. If the military advice was heeded that this is not the time to do what was called a forward policy of deploying people in penny packets uh, without being realized. Give context, sir. Okay. So, you have a 4,000 kilometer border with the Chinese. In 1962, we had uh, barely about 1,000 people in Ladakh looking after that, say, 970 kilometers of border with China. Harsh conditions. No logistics support in the sense that no supply chain because six months the roads used to be closed. There used to be no roads. You had to supply by air. Similarly, in what was called NEFA, Northeast Frontier Agency, now Arunachal Pradesh, um, the uh, remotest areas were not accessible by uh, even foot. You had to really climb mountains and get there. But you went and said, okay, this is the line that the British have drawn. This is the boundary between then Tibet and India, later China and India. And we must defend it at any cost. 
so the military advice was that we are now in no position to put people there and when i say penny packets if you put four soldiers in a in a post they need to be backed up by 10 other people in terms of giving them rations giving them ammunition continuously supplying them and supporting them but you only had those four people there but there was no 10 people here and therefore that became a penny packet where which can be attacked any time overwhelmed any time and that's exactly what the chinese did in in a month's time they humiliated the indian military which was not bad they fought very valiantly uh, very bravely we have had stories about all that of 1962 but the this was not a military plan it was just a emotional and a uh, in hindi they say hawa mein kiya hua plan and therefore uh, we lost and if we had won uh, then uh, we would have become a preeminent power in uh, asia much earlier than uh, now uh, we are poised to become a large uh, country i mean a big power uh, which is wooed by the world and which uh, is looked up by many smaller neighbors as uh, somebody who can stand up to china as we have done in ladakh in in the last 3 years so all that would have changed but i think that psychological scar uh, of that huge humiliating defeat remained for several years in the official um hierarchy or official uh, machinery in the government of india what else did we lose we lost prestige we lost uh, standing nobody was uh, willing to touch us the americans went against us uh, we had to uh, go to the uh, soviet union which is now russia uh, for a treaty and despite that in 1971 and this is the resilience of this country and the leadership of indira gandhi Uh, we and the military leaders at that point in time sam manik shaw sm nanda pc lal they were these air navy and the army chiefs we won the 1971 war uh, very decisively one of the greatest military and uh, diplomatic and political triumphs you can see anywhere in the world uh, creation of a, another uh, nation state in bangladesh that happened but this is the uh, p- same people same army within 9 years had bounced back and won Uh, that famous victory just better planning better, better planning uh, you know taking time patience uh, like there is this famous story that uh, manik shaw sam manik shaw general sam manik shaw later field marshal sam manik shaw told the uh, the cabinet that this is not the time to go and the cabinet also had the same uh, understanding that uh, one should not initiate the war uh, we should not be seen india should not be seen as an aggressor so there were enough wise people at the top that time uh, in the bureaucracy in the diplomatic uh, community in the military and of course indira gandhi as the prime minister everyone decided that uh, this is not the time to launch the war in march uh, 71 1971 we could wait for the opportune time and that's exactly what they did in 13 days uh, the war was won you know something my generation doesn't know at all i won't say at all people are getting to know about it is indira gandhi's kind of grey legacy that's how i look at it and it is a grey legacy right so sure, there's always a mixed uh, bag for every leader you know really if you ask me but uh, grey legacy uh, in what sense you would you think that she was successful highly successful in some cases and then also was a dictatorial uh, leader that way yes okay. <laughs> pretty much <laughs> i can't add much more to that other than i mean we've had uh, some sick people on the show who look back at her in a very negative right. way mm-hmm. uh we've had people who look back at her fondly a lot of older women look at look back at her fondly so uh my outcome my download is that it's a little gray but yes. i think someone like you it is it is so i uh, i mean uh, i uh, was a young reporter i just started off when she was assassinated uh, within a year and a half of my starting off as a journalist uh 1984 riots is something that one uh, i didn't witness it but of course i was reading it and i was hearing it from fellow reporters in delhi all that uh so that was her bad legacy i mean there were a couple of mistakes that she made big mistakes one was the imposition of emergency against all her instincts and i would think uh, from the literature that is available and the people that i have spoken to that she uh, became isolated you know she was completely uh, cordoned off by her uh, son uh, sanjay gandhi 
and some of her uh, inner circle uh, people you'll have to give complete context so why don't you do like a quick okay. story of so Indra she Gandhi. grew she she came she became prime minister under unfortunate circumstances when lal bahadur shastri as her second prime minister died in russia mysteriously mysteriously in harness and in january 1966 she became the prime minister the congress party stalwart leaders in the congress party they were you know old style uh, leaders with ma- not mass base but uh, organizational control they thought they will be able to control her so she was actually at one point in time called gungi gudia you would have heard this uh, if you have read the literature and that she was a dumb doll to you know sort of uh, translated in english but she grew into a job thanks to some good advisors and all that and and our innate uh, nature and experience she would have had with her father for so many years 17 years jawalal nehru was the prime minister you think lady mountbatten also meant sorry yeah. sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> well, you know i'm sure they would have met i mean there are photographs of all that she would have been aware of uh, her father her father was a widower and um, i think uh, he uh, didn't think of uh, what people would think i mean now those photographs are coming out he lighting a cigarette of lady mountbatten or uh, laughing with her you know all those pictures have come out he got that swag <laughs> <laughs> he, he had i mean of course he was uh, handsome he was a kashmiri uh, and uh, fair uh, from what man what a scene but uh, that is something that I mean, she had a uh, i won't say a very successful marriage uh, indira gandhi herself Uh, but uh, i think political grooming was excellent and therefore she grew into a job and by uh, 1967 60 by 1969 she had come into her own and had become her own person in taking decisions 1971 was uh, her uh, highest kind of uh, achievement and glory days 71 war in fact atal bihari vajpayee praised her didn't call her durga do uh, like many people have alluded um but uh, what happened is increasingly the success meant that she increasingly became isolated by surrounded by uh, her uh, younger son sanjay gandhi who was a political goon uh, then uh, please you have to give context here also because he uh, was um, very aggressive and he wanted to control everything so he used to control appointments uh, with her he started that maruti project uh, i know very little about sanjay gandhi and rajiv gandhi so, no so rajiv gandhi was a pilot in the indian airlines that time so he wasn't much in the politics but sanjay gandhi again uh, it is before my time uh, also because uh, as i said i uh, started uh, journalism only in 1983 but i've read and you know there is interest in history so sanjay gandhi bansi lal and uh, all these people and uh, what happened was the one judgment of the alabad high court in electoral mal- malpractices went against her the uh, high court unseated her saying that she is uh, not she can't be an mp because she is indulged in these electoral uh, irregularities she tried hacking the voting system ha so that time there has to be booth capturing you know we didn't have evms that time the electronic voting machines so there has to be these boxes where you would put uh, the uh, paper ballots and uh, booths were uh, sort of there uh, large booths where you could isolate that booth and get your own supporters or your own people to just uh, put in paper ballots in your name and uh, do that uh, isolated way or uh, without anybody knowing or even with somebody knowing you just put in the paper so that used to be called booth capturing it was an art you know, of the political parties whoever was the bahubali would be able to do that so we have come a long way from there so anyway she was unseated wild west wild west <laughs> yeah many ways bihar what kind of india did you Uttam guys have <laughs> man <laughs> see the, but we have survived that and we have come to this stage so we have seen both sides we have seen the wild west of uh, india or the wild west kind of india um, poor underprivileged uh, shortage of everything we used to uh, wait for 3 years to get a uh, scooter a bajaj two wheeler Uh, to be bought i don't want to know all this also <laughs> because like you will not realize depressive. it yeah when i my parents talk about it, it seems sad, it's sad yeah. like you it guys is. look at it fondly but that's not no, a I'm country saying, so we went through all that i mean the we uh, we had shortages but today look at your generation i mean you know uh, you never feel that uh, shortage yeah. you're uh, privileged you're entitled and it's good and the country yeah. is progressing The, so anyway, the, to come the, back to the Indira only Gandhi. reason I like knowing is the perspective and yes, you know exactly. a better picture. Yeah, and no, and you struggled for life. I mean, you know, uh, people uh, didn't have luxury of uh, holidays. Yeah. People didn't have uh, luxury of uh, off days. Gen Zs, ten years younger than me, 
their parents are also 10 years younger than my parents yes basically born in the 70s those parents mine are born in the 60s 60s like, yeah very different mentality correct they saw that uh, uh, opening up of the indian economy yeah. and all absolutely. that absolutely they let their kids do whatever they want yeah. my parents generation was difficult to even tell my parents i want to do entrepreneurship yeah exactly and, like <laughs> Anyway, let's. <laughs> so I don't. I don't blame you guys. So come. No, nothing. I mean, I'm just giving you a perspective. We've actually benefited hugely because we survive. Uh, we can survive in any circumstances. Yeah. Is what I feel, and that's been our strength. Toughness. Toughness in everything: mental, uh, physical, uh, financial. Uh, we've seen bad days. Very uh, poorly paid uh, profession, uh, underpaid, overworked profession that I worked in. Uh, but not a moment's regret. Uh, but to come back to Indira yes. Gandhi, <laughs> uh, so Sanjay Gandhi took hold of her psychologically in a way. Then he was controlling her towards the end, sort of 80s. After the emergency, she became isolated. She got defeated in the elections in 1977. Then she came back because uh, they were squabbling the old people who had come in the Janata Party between 1977 and 1980. Then she came back to power. But by that time, she had become. completely dependent on sanjay gandhi who was her younger son and politically uh, the controlling master of the uh, party dependent uh, the congress in sense of taking decisions and uh, uh, posting bureaucrats uh, appointing chief ministers all that he was doing he was the power behind the throne and what was his skill set or whatever nothing he, he, the power was derived from the mother uh, and the third generation uh, of the nehru gandhis Uh, like that like younger younger Sally. brash and you know, ah, okay. kind of thing but he died in a uh, air crash in 1982 mysteriously uh, not really he was again reckless so he was flying that uh, small plane in, in uh, delhi subdarjang area and uh, what happened nobody knows i mean mysteriously you can call it mysterious but i mean obviously he was it's like uh, taking out a sports car Uh, and driving rashly uh, like the young rich kids do even today we have heard you know the bmw case we have done uh, heard about other thing it must have happened that way i am not very sure what exactly happened but he crashed in delhi and died and then rajiv gandhi was forced to enter politics and the rest is history so indira gandhi therefore uh, 71 peak of her popularity peak of her abilities to take strategic decisions she broke up pakistan created uh, help create bangladesh she uh, formed uh, i mean she did so many strategic uh, decisions she took merger of sikkim into india in 1975 uh, she also did uh, creation of the rnaw uh, in 1968 under her watch so many things to her credit but then later part she sort of slid down the popularity and then became dictatorial uh, not by instinct but by circumstances i would think uh, to be charitable because of uh, as i said the setback in the elections then the defeat in the elections in 1977 and then the paranoia which comes in when you are isolated from the feedback you get from different people when it only one or two people give you feedback or when one or two people uh, tell you uh, what uh, others are thinking uh, you are hearing control over control uh, complete psychological control uh, or you know the feedback mechanism is then controlled by those people so they are telling you the things that you want to hear rather than what is actually happening then you become like that and then by the time uh, she took this decision to enter, send the army into the golden temple in 1984 i think uh, uh, she was overwhelmed by the circumstances and uh, bad advice uh, because uh, sending army against your own people is uh, always bad judgment and it went wrong the operation uh, i mean it was an impossible operation and then she paid with her life uh, by her bodyguards uh, assassinated her as we know and india is still paying for it 40 years later yeah in some ways but i think we have also learned lessons i mean we have come out of that wo kehta hai na sona nikhar ke aata hai aag mein se aata hai tab so india is in that position now you've come through so many insurgencies so much of turmoil so many you know uh, unrest in so many parts of this country together i think uh, 80s and the 90s were terrible for india in terms of both uh, communal riots and these insurgencies this khalistan problem in punjab terrorist problem in punjab financial crunch we've come through all that so i think uh, this generation is lucky in that sense you know this whole thing about manmohan singh opening up the economy in 1993 my question was always why didn't it happen in 73 or 63 or 53 because we adopted nehru adopted what is called the commanding heights of socialism uh, model uh, from the soviet union and indira gandhi continued it 
I mean, she had the legacy of her father to continue, but also probably pressure from the Soviet Union. That's one, and also, uh, you know, that it was easy to uh, mislead people or keep people under control by saying, "We are giving Garibi Hatao." Her slogan in 1971 elections was "Garibi Hatao." So, for 40 or whatever, 30 years since 47 or uh, 25 years since 47, you had not uh, removed poverty or not even made attempts to remove poverty. Instead, you were saying, "Abhi hame chance dijiye, hum Garibi Hataenge." You know, that was the political game that was being played, that you keep as many people uh, poor so that you can control them as vote banks, you get them. That was the policy at that point in time. You, empty lack, slogans. Lack of money means lack of education. Exactly. Lack of education and, uh, means control. Empowerment. There was no empowerment. I mean, you don't take informed decisions then. Then you go like cattle, whoever tells you. That's exactly what used to happen. But uh, again, credit to uh, Narsimha Rao as Prime Minister. Of course, forced by circumstances to open up the economy. Uh, and uh, while most of the credit goes to Manmohan Singh uh, in popular imagination or in popular literature, without the political backing and political uh, support of uh, Prime Minister Narasimha Rao, this wouldn't have happened. Why don't you talk a little bit about PM Narasimha Rao? Because my generation doesn't know too much, honestly. Okay, again. My, my first memory of PM is Gujral. Okay, 1997, yeah. He was there for like a year, right? Yeah, so again, that was a, see, uh, one has to also look at the period between 1989 and um, 2014. Uh, we had a period of coalition governments in uh, Delhi, where there were weak governments, there were compromised governments, they were constantly compromising on issues, because the, no, sing, no single party got majority. After Rajiv Gandhi in 1985, you had Narendra Modi getting the majority in 2014. So that period also weakened India quite a lot because, you know, people could be bought from smaller parties, bigger parties. Uh, they could be compromised and they would compromise for their own interests. All that happened in that period. But uh, Narasimha Rao was, uh, doesn't get the credit that he deserves because he uh, did two or three things which uh, saved India from total doom. What you saw in Sri Lanka in uh, 2022, India was in that position like in, in 1990 was... because we uh, shipped our gold to uh, mortgage it uh, to the uh, in the European banks because we didn't have enough money. So the IMF and the World Bank said you'll have to do A, B, C, D up to Z to reform your economy, open up the economy, liberalize it as they call it. But he was firm and he was not in full control of the parliament, mind you. We didn't have the full majority. He was a compromise candidate because Rajiv Gandhi had got assassinated. Uh, Congress party had reluctantly made him the Prime Minister. But he made sure that the country remained intact. Country overcame that uh, crisis. How was Rajiv Gandhi as a PM? Well, he uh, was uh, very... Uh, uh, the word that I should use is that uh, uh, he was idealistic. Uh, but uh, without uh, being rooted in the reality of the practical, uh, real politic of it. South Delhi, Kinlamanya. Yeah, exactly, Doon School. Okay. Now I have nothing against the Gandhi family. Dude. No, no. Like this is whole, <laughs> neither, whole podcast. Neither do I, because I have nothing, uh, I don't do deal in uh, political reporting or whatever. I'm just giving you sure. what what I thought of at that point in time. That he, he when he was elected, he was young, he was progressive, he, he was the first uh, jeans clad prime minister. His wife was uh, beautiful. She seemed, you know, they seemed a very ideal couple. I saw them in Mizoram in 1986. He driving an open Jeep. You know, people were so impressed and uh, so hopeful. But he let that legacy slip because of several uh, wrong decisions and bad advisors again. You know, you collect your own uh, buddies from school uh, who have no uh, political experience, who have no connection to the real Bharat. Uh, you're confined to the uh, the, con uh, the uh, Tony clubs of uh, Delhi and Bombay and uh, Calcutta. So you don't have the real feel. And that's exactly what happened with Be him. Before I let you continue further on the story, yes. let's come back to present day context. Right. Uh, because a lot of people are listening to us. Yes. And uh, they're assuming that you are uh, pro-BJP and anti-Congress. No, no, no. So just give I, some I, I'm context. I'm not uh, uh, pro or uh, anti this thing. I, my, I'm uh, giving you a very uh, objective perspective of an observer who's lived through these times. Yeah. That I was also very hopeful. I've written pieces, I remember, in the local newspapers that I was in, that Rajiv's glory year, 1985. 
he went to the us he wooed the uh, us joint session of the uh, us congress and uh, the senate uh, reagan uh, welcomed him with open arms you know there, there are pictures and uh, thing it, he was so impressed uh, the americans were impressed the american press was so impressed because he was suave he was uh, fluent in english you know he, he seemed like for them people like us kind of thing uh, to the western world and uh, he did uh, try to get in a lot of new progressive ideas into the government so he introduced computers he uh, also uh, wanted to privatize some of the uh, government enterprises he uh, had a good railway minister in uh, madhavrao sindhya who actually uh, computerized the railway reservation system during his time many of these things happened but his larger vision or larger control of the government and the international role that india should have played went haywire because he was also impetuous he was impatient so the sri lanka accord was forced on the tamil tigers in 1987 which uh, then finally resulted in his own assassination by the tamil tigers in 1991 um, similarly he did uh, many accords at one point in time <laughs> we used to call him an accordion because he did mizoram accord he did assam accord he did a gorkhaland accord he did punjab accord he did a Daj, that's the gorkhaland accord and the punjab accord and the sri lanka accord so six accords in 3 years uh, so he was trying to you know uh, get things shore up things but again very hasty and uh, impetuous he sacked a foreign secretary publicly because uh, he disagreed with him or he announced uh, some decision before the prime minister could announce so in a press conference he said tomorrow you will see another foreign secretary sitting here humiliating the bureaucracy goes against you you are doomed as a as a prime minister or a chief executive of this country uh, so that happened to him and therefore i am saying this that after he got defeated in the 1989 elections uh, then we had a series of these short lived governments so ik gujral hd devagoda vp singh to begin with after rajiv gandhi Nine months, ten months. Chandrasekhar. We had um, V. P. Singh, Chandrasekhar, uh, Gujral, Devagoda, followed by Narasimha Rao. Then Vajpayee's thirteen-day government in 1996, followed by a three-year, uh, one and a half-year-old government, eighteen months government in uh, again Vajpayee, and then a five-year term for uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee from 1999 to 2004. and then we had manmohan singh for the next 10 years do you think if rajiv gandhi had not been assassinated he would have been good for the country in the long term yes he was actually he had matured he had decided i mean he had realized what his mistakes were and he was about to implement or uh, eliminate those mistakes and implement new plans he was full of beans i remember when he was assassinated it was a big shock not just to his family or to the congress party but to the nation because that time he was he had learned his lessons he had uh, as i said matured he had also uh, realized that india is not um, a homogeneous uh, entity and uh, not, not a small country it has different different problems and they should be tackled at different levels and his speech in 1985 or oh, sorry uh, before he became the prime minister i don't now i get the dates confused but whatever he made one speech to the all india congress committee in bombay attacking the old guard in the party now if you take on the old guard they are also going to resist they are also going to gang up on you so you know he didn't have that uh, understanding of at in the first term that he was prime minister if he had become prime minister in 1991 as was expected i suspect uh, he would have done far better and we would have had a different direction to the recent history of india lavanya was turning into shubman gill yes <laughs> probably <laughs> sorry for the cricket probably reference. no no so cricket is of course one of my earliest passions yeah. so i don't mind that analogy shubman's been coming up a lot on the show yes. no matter oh. i love shubman gill okay. anyway let's, let's looks like on. you i think almost <laughs> <laughs> it's punjabi <laughs> connect uh, yeah. but okay uh, yeah The reason I asked you about uh, Rajiv Gandhi was because I hear a lot of people from your generation saying if he had survived, we would have been in a different. I agree. Area. I agree. I agree. He was, like I said, he had very progressive ideas. He was modern in many ways. He was different from the earlier generations of politicians when he took over. He would have been probably eighty or eighty-two now if he if he was alive. But that time, thirty years ago, nineteen ninety-one or twenty-two years, thirty-two years ago. he would have been a great prime minister because of the maturity that he had achieved because of the defeat political defeat he went through see defeat makes you uh, much more responsible much more responsive tough times make tough men absolutely hmm. okay 
slightly controversial question but do you see glimpses of him in rahul gandhi not really i haven't uh, seen him uh, my problem with rahul gandhi again is this when he had the chance he didn't take up any ministerial responsibility no matter how good a politician you are no matter how good a leader you, you are and that is again to be proved he hasn't proved himself on that if you don't have an experience uh, as a government uh, minister or a government position it's difficult for uh, me to imagine somebody i mean rahul Ga- Ra- rajiv gandhi did manage but he faltered because he didn't have an experience unlike indira gandhi who had the uh, who had seen it from close quarters she had also become minister in uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri's uh, uh, cabinet. Rahul Gandhi's problem is that he doesn't have any ministerial experience or the inner working of the government. He doesn't know. The government is not about just politics or policies. It's also about how you implement, how you scale up uh, the policies, how you implement them, how you uh, reach to the last person, which he is lacking right now. And therefore, I don't see him in the same mold as uh, Rajiv Gandhi. Okay. he's not hustled enough not hustled enough he hasn't uh, hasn't got that experience i mean just to put it very uh, pithily uh, i think uh, it's one thing to talk about many policies and the things that you want to change and then mohabbat ki dukaan and all that uh, it's hard task and it's a uh, hard grind to uh, come into the government and then uh, implement policies that you want to do it's not easy do you ever get asked these kind of questions generally <laughs> Well, sometimes when I do these uh, informal chats with uh, journalism students, or uh, sometimes some people want to just have a informal uh, adda with me in various small towns and cities, these things do come up. That's exactly what a podcast. Exactly. Is. Informal adda. <laughs> informal adda. <laughs> Feel I've missed out on whatever happened before my birth. So, <laughs> like, uh, am I giving you a snapshot of that? <laughs> pretty much, man. Yeah. Like, I think. Uh, often when you grow up in urban centers uh up till that point where you're a teenager you don't care about the news exactly. you gradually get into sure, it etc sure. yeah. so in my adulthood i intend on just lapping up all that information that i missed out on and there's so much of information to lap up yeah which is why we will move into what i've been dying to ask you from the start of this podcast and this is the part of your life which i am in awe of you reported kargil from on ground uh why did you decide to actually go there well the credit must go to my best editor that i worked in my career vinod mehta of outlook and um, there was no way uh, sitting in the northeast in guwahati that i would have had a chance to go and report from kargil which is the other extreme of the country from east to northwest he sent me because he said uh, this fellow knows the military a little bit he interacts with them regularly uh, he also travels in the toughest parts of the northeast uh, without complaint so let's send him there and one fine day one afternoon so it was all of a sudden that i get a call come to delhi your tickets for uh, lay have been done so i said why you are going and reporting from kargil That's first, how it happened. First emotion in your heart was well, b- big opportunity, also big responsibility, and then a bit, a bit, one percent of fear, because I already had a family to support, two two boys, uh, my wife, uh, we were already married for ten uh, years, eleven years, uh, but that was the last thought, of course. First was excitement, second was uh, apprehension whether I'll be able to bring the correct reports. I'd never reported outside northeast. till then so i had done about 16 years in the profession by that time but all of it uh, reporting the seven states or eight states of the northeast basically correct reports would depend on the conversations you'd end up having in car exactly and the understanding and the the kind of uh, uh, interpretation that you couldn't do on what was happening on ground so i came to delhi and the next morning early morning there is to be flight to le we landed in le i was given a rookie photographer with me vinod mehta was insistent always that the every print story must be accompanied by great photographs so there was a photographer with me and i flew in there on a wednesday morning and i was told by saturday afternoon uh, your story your report has to be uh, in fact friday night your report has to be on the uh, delhi desk so barely two days to work on 
and that was the scary part the first uh, first week or the first four days because after we reached there uh, wednesday evening uh, that time kargil used to take about 9 hours from le by road so we first hired a cab piled on uh, some rice some biscuits some water because there was no hotels there uh, to uh, stay in or even get food uh, we were told about it i mean my couple of my colleagues senior colleagues had been to kargil before me for the previous two weeks so some uh, input was there so we went and there was no place to stay so the first two nights we uh, slept in the in the sumo uh, by the river side in kargil and uh, with, started with the threat of artillery with the threat firing. of the shelling and the firing all that but frankly i mean okay uh, kargil was a high point certainly no doubt because the high point came after the war in the sense that i dug out uh, thanks to my editors encouragement Uh, stories that were uncomfortable for the uh, army and the government we uh, raised questions about intelligence failure we raised questions about what went wrong and what could have been avoided and so many deaths could have been avoided all that we did in cover stories of kargil so that they were the tougher part the stories to do but uh, that time in those 45 days that i was there from maybe 3rd or 4th of june to 26th of july um, every week we used to travel between le and Kargil and Dras and Batalik, all those those places which became famous later. Vikram Batra, I met the famous Vikram Batra. Met him. Met him, and uh, third day after that, uh, he died in that action. So there is a photograph of him uh, standing in front of a long, big gun, machine gun, uh, which he had captured in the first operation that he had done, and uh, he had narrated the story of how Pakistan is were taunting him, Sher Shah. अब वापस नहीं जा पाओगे वगैरह बट ही वॉज अ वेरी गंग हो एंड अ वेरी कॉन्फिडेंट यंग मैन एट दैट पॉइंट इन टाइम यू वॉच शेर शाह द मूवी आई डेंट आई डेंट बिकॉज आई हैव एवरी थिंग इन माई हेड सो आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू गो एंड स्पॉइल दैट माई क्वेश्चन वॉज गुन बी दैट वॉट यू थिंक मूवीज कांट कैप्चर मूवीज कांट कैप्चर द रियल एक्शन द इमोशंस एंड द फियर पीपल हैव द सोल्जर्स हैव आई मीन दे आर नॉट एज इफ दे आर सुपरमैन or they don't have fear in fact fear drives them in many cases to do the acts of bravery that we see and um, uh, soldiering is the only profession where people go beyond their call call of duty right they lay their lives on line i mean uh, putting lives on line is no other profession demands that i mean except uh, people in uniform nobody else demands that and to do that uh, with great discipline uh, and without any uh, anything uh, expecting anything in return i think is the greatest virtues of soldiers i have written essays on this the indian soldier uh, ask for such uh, so little from the society or from the government and yet remains uh, cheerful remains committed remains uh, patriotic and also uh, Uh, sort of loses lives in the process so i saw all that so kargil was good uh, in uh, so long as it, uh, of the experience of reporting was concerned because i lived with them i ate parts of their rations uh, puri sabji sometimes sometimes the uh, typical rajput regiments uh, you know, the laddu that they make uh, churan and uh, the ch- churma as they call it uh, churma laddu kind of a thing and um, i saw their uh, lives uh, from close quarters but it wasn't my uh, i i didn't have uh, any fear because i didn't see hand to hand combat really we were always on the road the hand to hand combat was happening on the peaks which we didn't climb and anybody who makes uh, ha- or has made career out of the kargil glory in in our field in journalism is actually lying when you say that we were in danger we were not never in danger in that sense uh, in fact i felt more uh, fearful and uh, i was in more da- dangerous situations in the northeast and uh, when i was uh, detained uh, obli kidnapped or uh, forcibly uh, confined twice by uh, militants obli insurgents in the northeast no we we'll we're going to cover no, this no i'm saying also. so that was more fearful that was more challenging than kargil but kargil certainly made me uh, i mean gave me a higher profile people came to know my byline nitin gokhle and uh, that also then brought me to uh, delhi ndtv invited me in 2006 7 years later so that was kargil what was vikram batra like off camera he was genuine he was um, passionate 
uh, and he was committed. So I know his boss who retired as the Northern Army Commander. Colonel Joshi. Yes. So later, uh, I mean, uh, was the Northern Army Commander during the Ladakh crisis. Very close friend, Joe. Uh, and uh, Sanjay that played him in the LOC car. Game. Yes, I believe so. I, I didn't see I'm that. I'm sorry, army folks. <laughs> no, Laksha, I saw one of those movies which I was impressed with, which except for Amitabh Bachchan, who has again been my uh, favorite uh, of the 80s and the 90s. But in that movie, he was over the top in Laksh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, but otherwise, it was a quite realistic portrayal of uh, soldiers or you know the fears that the soldiers go through. And the kind of training that they get to become what they become, what Rithik Roshan's character becomes at the end. Laksh was uh, quite good. And Vikram Batra was like that. So he was passionate. Only thing that he knew was to lead his men at that young age. He had just graduated out of the Indian Military Academy in 1998. And I found him uh, ever smiling for whatever that uh, couple of hours that we interacted in the Mashko Valley uh, near Dras in uh, near Kargil. I found him to be very cheerful, very happy-go-lucky kind of a person. And then later I met his twin, uh, 10 years later, who is an ICICI bank officer, uh, who is also as cheerful and as uh, you know happy uh, person. So I have that memory, but there were several others who did equally daring, equally dangerous missions, uh, got some rewards, some didn't get it. But that's the nature of the war and uh, they live with it. What was the most haunting thing you saw in Kargil? Again, uh, soldiers injured, their limbs severed, and, you know, they are in pain. Um, so, as I said, uh, I saw death up close in the northeast much more than I saw in Kargil. Because the, if it happened, it happened on the peaks and they were just carried into the ambulances or in the helicopters. Didn't see that. But what I saw uh, as a collective psyche of the Indian soldier was, uh, he doesn't question orders. He is fully committed to what is to be done at whatever cost, even to the cost of his life. And uh, knows only one thing, that they are here to do a job and they will do it without reservation, without questioning. I think for me, that is the greatest virtue and that remains uh, in my mind. It's not haunting, but it's something that I respect them enormously for. Uh, as far as the Indian soldier is concerned. That was the one moral of the story you got from that story of your life. Absolutely. Greatness of the Indian Army. And greatness of the Indian Army, the, the commitment that they have to this nation. Okay. The Indian military in general. Indian military, of course. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now I will ask you about when you got kidnapped in the Northeast. <laughs> <laughs> well, to call it kidnapping will be a slight exaggeration. But uh, yes, there, there was an incident. I mean, the, these two incidents were... Something that when I look back, it could have gone either way. Did you get hit? By no, nobody hit me. Uh, but the very fact that... Uh, okay, so let me give you the background of how it happened. So there was a massacre in uh, Tripura in a place called Khowai of uh, say about 45 Bengali people by the tribals and a group I think called the NLFT, the National Liberation Front of Tripura. Uh, and I rushed from Guwahati, which was uh, a flight away to Agartala, which is the capital of Tripura, and uh, went into that area very early, very quickly before any other reporter or camera person could go there with another colleague from Agartala. So we recorded everything, we met the victims, all that. And while, while we were coming back, we were stopped by this gun-toting youngsters, a group of youngsters, forced to sit on the floor of the Maruti van and taken to an unknown destination. We were again not blindfolded or anything of that kind. But they were all trigger-happy people. I mean, they had guns and uh, weapons in their hand. And when they made us sit on the ground in a hut, some, in, in some remote area, we were sitting on the ground and they were all surrounding us uh, and heated, you know, discussion. Why are you here? Who are you? You are a military intelligence guy. I was much leaner and thinner than what I am now. Uh, but I always sport a crew cut. So they said, you are so-and-so. I said, no, I am an Outlook reporter. Said, well, that uh, can be done by anybody. The ID card can be uh, conjured up by anybody. So that was uh, dangerous because my thought at that point in time was that if one of them decides to bump me and my colleague off, uh, we would be dying for no reason. But that for them, it's a publicity. That was my thought. I was not uh, afraid of uh, being detained. 
uh, I was not afraid of being detained for a longer time because they would go and verify and then come back because they normally wouldn't like to antagonize the press. Uh, but that was a, a problem. When you've played sports semi-professionally in the same way, you have a, even if you've ever played at any level, yes. you have an understanding of how to talk to other human beings because so much of sports is communication. I want to ask you what your mindset was when you're trying to persuade these insurgents. Like, how do you even go about that conversation? Do you, are you supposed to be intimidating? Are you supposed to be sweet so that you become a friend? Like, what do you do? So, I did a mix of things. I was not intimidating at all. I was um, very calm, at least on the uh, outward uh, demeanor that I had was I was very calm. I tried to act as an elder brother to these people. There, there were 20s and 25 year olds uh, who were there. I could see that. And obviously, they had no clue of what outlook was or where, where I was coming from, all that. So, I and uh, luckily, I know a smattering of uh, Bengali. Uh, I mean, I can make myself uh, understand. I knew Assamese very fluently. I know Assamese very fluently, speak speaking uh, Assamese fluently. So, I made them uh, understand that, look, we mean no harm. Uh, you've detained us. Fine, your leader has gone or your courier has gone to check. I know it will take 12 hours, 14 hours. Uh, I'm willing to stay here, but let's talk and let's not. Uh, so, they were also taken aback by uh, no hysterical reaction. And I kept telling my younger photographer colleague, who was a local boy, half tribal, half Bengali, a dangerous uh, combination, that don't worry, uh, let me speak. And if I need to translate something, I will tell you, but let me handle this. So, I think um, this is again inborn or something again through circumstances that if there's a crisis, I become calmer. I, I become, I won't say ice cold, but I, I sort of uh, just calm down and I very uh, dispassionately uh, analyze the situation and talk about it. So, we kept talking. That's how I dealt with it. Is this the most dangerous situation you've been in? Uh, in your yes, whole career? I think so. Closest to death. Closest to no. It see that's again as an exaggeration. I would say I don't want to be uh, appearing to be uh, over the top. Uh, yes, I mean in the sense that as I said, my fear was if one of them decides that this is a great publicity stunt, and this has happened to uh, another uh, colleague. I'm uh, not a colleague, but an NGO worker in Assam in 1997, two years before this incident. So, my thought went back to that incident that that fellow was bumped off because it got them international publicity. Of course, a bad publicity, but any publicity sometimes is considered good. So, that was my thought. And then the other thought was that uh, what if my, uh, if wherever they are going to check, if they don't get the right answer, then what is my fate? Uh, so, that was the other fear. But that was the closest uh, or the most dangerous situation, I would think. And the other was, of course, uh, uh, it was hilarious in parts that I went to interview an insurgent leader and his rival uh, gang or rival group, uh, after I had finished the interview, we were coming back, uh, stopped us again forcibly and said, why did you go to him? He's not the big uh, group. We are the more influential ones. Now come with us to our leader. So forcibly took us there and then made us uh, wait for two days. Uh, so, you know, and again, that time there were no mobile phones, uh, no phones, so you were in Kaminikado. Stupid question, but what do they feed you when you're kidnapped? Well, uh, local uh, rice and uh, fish and dal, so they have, they're adequately stocked. But they take care of you? They, yeah, they, they, the, the first group, the Tripura group uh, did take care, uh, they fed us, they gave us Nariyal Pani, uh, they did all that. And then, in fact, the, the most satisfying thing at the end of it when uh, we were told to go or released was uh, they have these calves you know, that they uh, weave. It's called Gamosha in Assam and uh, otherwise. They One of them gave it to me, sort of put it at, around my... Uh, Sorry, neck. bro. No, exactly. <laughs> they didn't say it exactly that, but that meant it was a gesture that, okay, this was a misunderstanding. And I also you know played it magnanimous. Okay, thank you. All the best to your for your struggle. What's the ahead. reality of the Northeast now? Northeast, except for this, what has happened now in Manipur, I think uh, is uh, totally under control. Uh, the violence levels have come down. Development has become far better. Uh, connectivity has increased. Uh, there are more opportunities for people to go out, do all that. So, Northeast of my time uh, is no longer uh, recognizable. Uh, I mean, there's no comparison between that and uh, this Northeast. And I would think it's all the more, uh, all for the better of the people. Very gentle people, very nice people. 
some perceived uh, injustices some real injustices have been done to them and uh, therefore the history of uh, northeast is again violence uh, was uh, rampant development was uh, lacking uh, the belongingness to india was uh, missing but all that has uh, changed over the years because time also heals some of the wounds uh, sometimes uh, more information means or more uh, information available to the people directly not through the politician means that they also start understanding that they are being played by uh, politicians for their own political reasons when you talk to people from the northeast there's a lot of people who feel neglected by the indian governments in general sure uh, because of a lack of development and they like you know there's so many micro situations that come up when you actually live in the northeast for example if you want to take a flight to bangkok it's a 2 hour flight from the northeast but there's no flight to bangkok from the northeast so they have to go to delhi and then fly to bangkok True. or to calcutta and then fly there but then they had started all that there is a see like i said there is a perceived neglect and there is real neglect first of all partition uh, in the west in uh, between punjabs of the two sides now was violent uh, we had more killings and uh, more deaths in that partition uh, migration but the effect of partition on the northeast was far uh, greater and longer lasting than the effects uh, on the western parts of india and i'll explain why because earlier the connectivity to uh, the seas from the northeast used to be through what is now bangladesh when the partition happened and when east pakistan was created you can cut off those old links mm. of commerce of connectivity of trade all that and suddenly say from tripura's capital agartala where you would go through the current bangladesh in the pre partition days and reach calcutta from agartala in 12 hours or 24 hours you started taking by road you started taking 5 days because you had to come through that small chicken snack corridor at siliguri because you've cut off the uh, physical links and you created a separate country so that effect uh, lasted too long for the northeast the development suffered uh, connectivity suffered people couldn't go out they became isolated so out of mind became out of sight uh, physical distance also meant that uh, not much uh, attention was paid by the successive governments at the center in fact again come back to the jawalal nehru i have a full uh, presentation on this when i do i have divided the history of northeast via the tenures of different prime ministers so i've called uh, nehru jawalal nehru a benevolent dictator for the northeast he would say oh they are very simple people they are tribal people let them be let them remain how they are you know those headgear the tribal attire uh, no need for uh, development. big development like that so first 17 years you had this then uh, indira gandhi came i call her the durga and the lakshmi she tried the durga avatar first by sending in the army uh, first instance and the only instance so far touchwood against our own people where air force planes have gone and bombed uh, a population center like aizol in mizoram it was under indira gandhi and um, then when that then that didn't work she started if you can't beat them buy them so she is poured in many uh, thousands of crores of funds uh, to create a class divide in the northeast see the tribal society doesn't have any uh, divide of like the the uh, you know what what is there in the rest of india where you have a brahmin you have a shudra you have dalit you have a vaishya nothing of the kind in the tribal area but then she created through this monetary uh, incentives she created two classes haves and have nots so a cabal of bureaucrats politicians businessmen became rich overnight fill the rich and the people who it was meant for the development funds they got left behind so she created the divide so, so that's durga and lakshmi i call that avatar of hers like that so the best prime minister uh, who uh, did a lot for the northeast was vajpayee uh, and uh, then manmohan singh i would say because he had a long tenure 10 years otherwise everybody else and surprisingly the best plans were made by devegaud <laughs> to the northeast he spent 7 days in the northeast uh, making up a package of development for the northeast so that's northeast for you 
what pm modi's government again mind. this is the the i mean now I, i was talking up to 2014 this government has done huge infrastructure development huge uh, development in connectivity uh, education uh, getting uh, the people uh, in the mainstream sports wise manipur assam all that so i think uh, they have built on what vajpay had started uh, the department i mean the development of the northeastern region as a separate ministry the first minister or one of the prominent ministers was arun shori under vajpay and uh, it began there and uh, modi has continued modi government has continued so now they have done uh, quite a lot of course uh, there is never an end to doing that because you have to i always say this that you fix northeast before you connect to southeast or east asia when we are saying act east before acting east india needed to fix northeast in in terms of uh, the parameters that are applied to other other states more or less it has been done now except for these lingering problems that are there ethnic divide becomes a quick uh, flare up as it has happened in manipur but that's because you have multiplicity of ethnic groups in the northeast Okay, where does that story go from you? It's going to be difficult to recover uh, very quickly. It's going to be. It is a deep-rooted wound. It reopens every twenty, thirty years. Uh, similar clashes had happened between the Kukis and the Nagas in nineteen ninety two, ninety three. But this one uh, is little more dangerous because seventy percent of the population. lives on uh, 30% or 20% of the land in the imphal valley the majority maithis and the rest of the 30% population lives on a uh, 60 or 70% of the land so there is this conflict and uh, uh, divide between uh, these two groups which is driving this uh, entire uh, flare up that we have seen in manipur unfortunate but that's uh, something that you cannot completely discount in northeast given so many groups and ethnic identities are there it's the identity politics in many ways oh. mm-hmm. all right didn't expect this conversation to go down <laughs> the routes way. that we went yes, down yes uh, you're known for your geopolitical analysis <laughs> primarily your analysis about the uh, world of defense right but i'm glad i'm glad uh, same here it was different for me otherwise i normally speak on the same issues of how india and china are competing <laughs> uh, how um, us and china uh, looks at india all that yeah, my, so my challenge as a podcaster is how do i position that question in new and interesting ways true, uh, true. so i'm actually glad we did this particular episode it's a great um, platform to you know do this kind of thing and since your audience is a younger audience and one of the things that i uh, look at uh, my role as is to give as much information as possible so one of the things that keeps me going is uh, of uh, the ability to share knowledge or experience if i can do that through you i'll be more than happy no no glad to be that uh, <laughs> means but uh, go closer we will see you thank you that was the episode for today and while i enjoyed this mostly historical conversation what i enjoyed about sir was his presence So the next time he is in Mumbai the conversation is going to be much more about the present and future of geopolitics is going to be about the world of defense in general and it's going to be about all the topics that you recommend please tell me in the comment section what else you'd like for me to speak with him about and please spread the word about this epic conversation that we've just had a lot more Indians need to know the truth about modern day India and the modern history that were not taught in our school textbooks keep supporting TRS because Ranveer and the team will be back soon. Mm-hmm.